Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Public Works Podcast. My name is Joseph Blackman. Today, I've got a treat for you. His name is Ray Belton, and he is a senior project manager, beautiful city of Houston in Texas. Ray, say what's up to everybody. Hello, everybody. I hope y'all having a happy Tuesday. Or do I do I say today? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> a happy day. <laughs> happy day. Happy yeah. day. Everybody's doing all well. All right. Sure thing, sure thing. All right, Ray, so you and I got connected on LinkedIn. Um, again, you're a senior project manager for the city of Houston. And these titles, man, I, like, we don't know what a senior project manager is. So give us, a, give us, I guess, an example of what a day looks like for Ray and then what a senior project manager does and is. Okay, so it's two ways of looking at this. Uh, my, my title, how I call myself, functionally here is the culture mechanic so i've been here at the city of houston for 20 years and 18 of the 20 years i was in houston water specifically in our wastewater operations and so that's where the mechanic part comes from <laughs> but my role every day is dealing with our culture and creating a thriving culture that everybody wants to be a part of and so if you were to look in that lens of wastewater, what it would look like every day is that I would overlook the operations and institute projects and oversee projects that help improve the operations. And so uh, my job was to look at some things in more detail. It's kind of like special projects and things of that nature. Um, some of them were around work management systems and things of that nature, being able to look at the data, um, analyze that data and say, what do we need to do? How are we going to pull this off? And then bringing in the parties and managing it, managing it so that the end result, whatever that scope of work is, that it gets done in the right amount of time at the right price. <laughs> you know, so but on, sure. on, on this other side of it, it's it's more of an analysis of what's going on and, and trying to understand what's happening with people what what are they experiencing in the organization and trying to come up with these initiatives or interventions that can help move the needle in those areas okay so you, uh, one thing that stuck out was the organizational experiences can you give us, like our listeners, a brief example of what you mean by that? Because, you know, we've all worked for companies and we all have experiences, but what are some of those on the public work side that a guy might go through where he has to come and talk to Ray about, you know, the, the culture mechanics? Okay, so it, it could be a, a wide range of things. M many times it's this feeling that, you know, they're coming to me because they have this, this feeling uh, that they are not empowered. Sometimes it can be something, you know, the big one that's common is the pay, right? Like, I'm not getting paid enough. <laughs> How do I make more money? How do I grow in the organization? And they may feel like the, the avenues that are there are not available to them. So, for instance, if they're on the front line and they're out there doing this work every day and it has to be done it's like when do i have time to go to class when do i have time to do all of these things and so i have to intervene and see if i can find ways for them to be able to go to class or find ways for them to uh, fit it into their schedule on their own they may have some aspirations that exceed what their current uh, job duties are and and sometimes that makes it difficult for the manager to say yes i'm going to send you to this computer science class you know <laughs> well that doesn't really get yeah. into you know us making this street straight today so you you have to kind of work with them and, and be be a negotiator be a mediator uh, but then it may be i just don't get along with my manager and and we're not communicating well uh, I don't think they like me, you know, this, that, and the other. It could be any number of things that uh, come up. But any, let me put it this way. Just go to the water cooler <laughs> and all of those conversations at the water cooler, that's what I deal with. <laughs> you know, I, I love this because, like, let's say there is a disgruntled employee. He doesn't feel like he can 
has any upward mobility or doesn't make enough or doesn't like his manager, normally the only person he could talk to that about is his manager. And that's usually kind of a tough conversation to have. Yeah. So you get a lot of guys, they just go into a, you know, into a shell and just kind of grumble and go forward. But I love how your city, you guys have a person like you who does that. Um, what would you, what would you say to some of the, I guess, smaller cities who don't have the budget for a U to get that done or to hack that? Well, the, the thing about my role is I was already fulfilling this senior project manager role and the, the organization just, you know, noticed we have, uh, this person who is creating value in this way in the organization, we're just going to shift him over. Right. And and so it wasn't a promotion or something like that. It was just a lateral move to say, we're going to use you in this way. So it was not an additional expense. You may have people there in your organization right now who are passionate. Uh, some, some organizations have unions and there are people in the union who are passionate about the work experience and, and how people come to work and, and are able to feel fulfilled in what they do, find meaning in what they do, feel like they're getting uh, treated fairly, so on and so forth for the fair work that they put in every day. So there are people within your organization who could rise to, to this level and, and who can do these things. Um, it's, it's not that I was an expert now, I did decide to go back to school. Once I saw myself on this trajectory, I went back to school, um, got a, a bachelor's degree in organizational leadership, and now I'm actually in school working on my master's. So it's setting that example too, right? And and the, whereas the organization doesn't necessarily pay for my school, the, the organization does have an affiliation with the school where I get it at a discount. So. It's you just find ways to support it, but something that that I'm promoting within the organization is this concept of psychological safety, and and that is the ability for a team member to come to their supervisor and to be able to express their opinions, their thoughts, their ideas, their concerns, and not feel that they're going to be humiliated in any way, that they're going to um, in some way be punished or that they're, they're going to be retaliated against because they share these these ideas. It's about creating this space where those ideas can come forward. And, and many times this is how the team is going to innovate itself. But but um, that relationship can improve if the person feels like I can share my authentic, I can be my authentic self, share my real thoughts with you and know that you're going to hear me out and have an objective conversation. Sure, sure. And the, the I keep going back to the cultural mechanic side of things. So like a mechanic, or let's say, you know, my car is not running right. Like it's, it's choking up, like you hit the gas, it doesn't really go like it normally does. Um, as a mechanic, you have to bring the car in, do a diagnostic, you know, uh, start with your, you know, feed, fuel, or fire, check your, you know, you start kind of reverse engineering the, the issue. Mm -hmm. So how does a manager know, like, when something is going wrong? Like, what's the, you know, the, you know, you put your ear to the motor, like, what are you listening for to know that maybe some of your guys are disgruntled or do need to be empowered? Okay, it's, it's, it's a, it's a matter of being very curious as a leader. So some of those things that I pull from my mechanic experience is this root cause analysis, right? I want to ask the five whys, you know, and, and as you ask these continual whys, you get down to what may be the true cause of this failure or what's going on. It's the exact same thing. It's that curiosity to ask more than one why, like, why did you mess up? Why, why you don't like this or whatever? It's a, oh, so so you're saying that when I communicated it to you, um, it wasn't clear. And, and they'll say, well, yes. Uh, can you help me out and explain what part wasn't clear for you? Well, it, in general, you said that you want it to be good, but I don't know what good is. Oh, thank you for sharing that with me. So this is what I meant by good. 
but you know they may have said something else that you would have kept asking but at this point you know what it is they don't understand what good is i need to be more specific about that and it and it improves the situation but those five whys are something that you just keep asking because when it comes to culture we we tend to think the culture is the things that we see but it's not what we see and what we experience. What we see and experience is the result of these underlying beliefs, these underlying experiences that people have gone through that shape how they see the world and shape how they solve their problems. Because that's what a culture truly is, is how people have come together and agreed upon how to solve problems. And when they think this is the way to solve it, like, I'm, it, pardon me, y'all, but if they think cussing this person out is the way to solve a problem, that becomes the culture. We just cuss each other out, right? <laughs> or if yelling at you is how you solve it. Oh, if somebody comes at you and questions you, you just yell at them and they'll back off. And that's how we solve this problem, you know? Or, or as a leader, if somebody comes to me with a problem, you just ignore them. Right, and that's how that's how I learned to solve that problem. It goes away, uh, where well, it may go away on the surface. They're not in your office. They're not in your face. But underneath there, it's all kind of thoughts starting to build. All kind of things starting to build. And guess what? They share those things. They tell the next person, "Don't go and talk to him. Don't go and talk to her." Right? They're not going to listen to you, so on and so forth. And before you know it, you're on an island as a leader by yourself trying to get this team to move in the right direction, but you've lost them. Sure, sure. And do you think this is more so generational? Because the word culture or the, the, or the thought of culture and like mental health, these are relatively new terms. I mean, I would say my generation of millennials, we came up with the whole mental health thing. So would you say that the majority of the guys or, or people you're consulting with are of the younger generation? Or do you have, you know, let's say people who are just about to retire, they're in their 50s. Do they still also come to get some, I guess, consultation with you? Yes, yes. We, we're a very diverse organization. Uh, that's one thing I love about Houston Public Works. So, you know, whether it's generational or cultural differences, um, it's, you kind of have everything here. <laughs> and, and it's one thing about life is it kind of happens to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you tend not to have, um, I, I tend not to experience people saying, you know, I don't want to talk to him or I don't want to share these things as much as them not understanding one another. That's why I really see the generational issues is not their willingness to share as much because when people are going through something, they kind of want to get it off their chest. They want to vent. They want to get it off. But typically they don't understand each other that's the bigger thing that i see is the, the generations not understanding one another sure sure so let's talk a little bit about ray how you got into this let's go through your career trajectory i guess from high school what got you into i guess public works and then um give us your career path into to where you're at today okay so really it was public works found me <laughs> I didn't necessarily find public works. I didn't, I wasn't looking for it. Uh, I, I grew up a hard worker. And, and so I started working early on in high school. Then by the time I graduated high school, you know, I, I had my own place and all of these things. Uh, and I really was, I had no intention to go to college, anything. You know, I just was going to work. This is what I knew. I seen my mom, I grew up with a single mother. I seen her work hard and I was just following that example. I had also uh, joined the National Guard, you know, so I, you know, did that on the weekends, uh, you know, one weekend a month. And so I was just going along and uh, I got frustrated, like, like life started hitting me in the mouth, things that I hadn't experienced and, and I got very frustrated and unfortunately, I, I just went to a life of crime. I grew up in a bad neighborhood. I had a lot of friends who did a lot of things. I avoided them because my mom was not just a hard worker. She was scary. 
<laughs> you know, scary enough to keep me out of trouble. But uh, having left the house, I, I just got frustrated. And I said, look, I have all these friends who are making all of this money. Why am I struggling? And uh, I began to do these things and it landed me in prison. I spent nine years of, of my life in prison. And uh, on one of the units that I was on, they actually had a wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> and uh, I decided to go, to go to school while I was there. And one of my classmates worked in that treatment plant. And we were talking about how hard it was to to uh, keep up with our classes and things. And he was like, it's not hard for me because I work at this treatment plant and I do these samples, I do this, I do that, but then I have a lot of downtime to study. I was like, oh, okay, that's nice. And fast forward, when I got out, I ran randomly, randomly, I ran into this guy on the street. <laughs> and he was like, you know what? You ought to look into this wastewater. They'll, they'll, uh, HCC, Houston Community College, they have a class. You go to the class, you can get your license, but the city of Houston will come and give you an application. They'll give you a shot. So I said, okay, let me try that. And I went through those classes. I got my license for water and wastewater. And once I started, it was a, it took a little while to get on, but once I started, I realized the difference that we were making. Like it was a powerful difference, not only for the community, but for the environment. And, and, the, and the thing that was interesting to me was that on the wastewater side, a lot of these facilities were like in my old neighborhood and I never knew that's what that was. What was that? <laughs> you, know? you didn't even realize. You see it every day, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was a major treatment plant in my neighborhood, several lift stations in my neighborhood. I never knew that these things, and now I knew that this is a way for me to impact my neighborhood in a positive way, to give back to my neighborhood, to make sure that the people and the environment in my neighborhood was safe. And, and I took pride in that and it, it just, it just captivated me. I, I wanted to learn more and more. So I came in as an operator trainee I worked as an operator for a little over a year. I, I got a little bit bored and I saw the maintenance guys. I was like, this is a little bit challenging. Let me try that. So I switched over. I became a utility mechanic and I was fortunate to run into a guy who had been on the job 33 years. He knew everything. He knew it back and forth. And whereas I didn't have a lot of maintenance experience, I told him, look, if you just train me, you don't have to touch nothing. I'll do it all. And this guy did. And with his training and with his help, within a little over a year, I made senior mechanic. I, I did that for a couple of years. And around the third year, I made supervisor. And, you know, that was a new experience. I moved from, from um, the lift stations to these satellite plants. Here in Houston, we have 39 treatment plants. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Like <laughs> we have 39 treatment plants and and just we've been consolidating. So now we're around to, you know, like maybe 389 lift stations. Um, so a, a lot of infrastructure. And I, I, I began to um, do maintenance in these satellite plants. And I did that for several years and I made section chief, uh, which which put me over even more plants. And I, I served that maybe two or three years and I made assistant manager. And, you know, in all of these cases, the, the scale of what you're doing is just growing. And, and then I made uh, uh, where I am now, the senior project manager. So I, I had quite a few steps, but it was that, yeah. it was that, uh, that constant hunger, that curiosity, you know, that desire to make a difference and how I became the culture mechanic is because I, I began to volunteer and do things, uh, do these trainings in the organization. And I really realized how much I loved that. And I realized, you know, as much as I loved solving problems 
it was really solving problems with people, right? It was really the people aspect that I really loved. And, and so I said, you know what? I want to pour into myself for this and I really want to do this. And something that I didn't mention is, is while I was in prison, you know, before then I did not have a relationship with God. And and I, I, I got a relationship with God and that was something that was passionate uh, for me was to share with people and to help people. And, you know, here at work, you know, you don't come here and say, oh, let's open the Bible and let's have some Bible study today. But these principles that I knew from the Bible were things that I knew helped me to honor people and to respect people and to show up in, with, a, with integrity about myself and to set up powerful example as a leader in the organization. So I was applying all of these things and this just really brought fulfillment to me. And that's why I'm still loving it after 20 years. Sure, sure, I love it. I love the story, but I do have some follow-up questions. So, I, I, and I've met other guys along my journey that do have a similar path to yours. They might've went to prison, they have a record. What do you say to those who think like, man, I got a record, I can never work for the government. You know, I can never work for the city. What do you say to those who are kind of skeptical about putting their, you know, their, their name in the hat for that position? You have to believe in yourself and, and you have to be willing to take a no, right? Like the path to success, you have to hurdle several no's. And, and believe me, I've, I've seen many of them. I had a lot of doors slammed in my face, even, even coming on with the city. I mean, they, they really grilled me about my past. <laughs> You know, and really said, like, are we going to have a problem here? And it took maybe three months or so for me to actually start. So the the question, the question is not, um, you know, what do I do? The question is, how bad do I want it? Right. If If you want it bad enough, you will figure out what to do. You just don't quit and say, you know, I want to make a career. I want to establish myself. And that's one thing about being in a public agency, being a public servant is that you have a, a high level of security in these type of jobs um, because people are going to always need water and they're going to always want that wastewater to leave their house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <So>. Always. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, another thing you talked about, you said you're with the guy who was 33 years in the in that position or he knew that industry for 30, 30, 33 years. And it's, I have a similar story. I was with the guy who's been in the industry for 30 years and I apprenticed under him for a whole year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the stuff that he downloaded into me isn't something that everybody gets because they weren't that close to that type of brain for that long. So what do you say to those who might have a guy in the yard and he's 25, 30 years in, but they're kind of skeptical to go, oh, well, I can just learn by bumping my own head. What do you say to be more proactive about learning from that guy? Yeah, you have to have this value for what they can bring to the table. You know, it, it doesn't devalue you to ask someone else for advice or for help. And I think that's what we feel sometimes is if I'm asking for help and somehow in some way that devalues me or that makes me uh, seem like I don't know what I'm talking about. But, you know, it's strength in knowing what you don't know. And when you have someone who's been around a thing that long, I think it's pretty obvious that they've seen some things that you haven't seen. And you just have to have that courage to go up to them and say, will you show me this? And, and and just be ready um, in the same way that we just asked that other question, be ready for a no. Because sometimes they feel like, no, nope, I don't have time for this. I'm not about to show you this, you know? And and in some cases, I'm just gonna keep it real. Some Sometimes they're threatened by you. And, and they feel like if I share this knowledge with you, you're gonna have a, a leg up on me. You might be able to pass me up if you know what I know. I'm using this knowledge I have as leverage, as power. And, and that may be the case, but I'll tell you this, just be persistent. Be persistent, keep asking, keep going. And even if they're not willing to share verbally, all you got to do is observe, just watch them. <laughs> watch yeah, them. Yeah. You'll find yeah. out a lot just by watching them. 
Okay, so Ray, let's talk about your current position. Um, what would you say is a skill set that a youngster would want to pick up on their journey to be good at what you're doing today? Uh, without a doubt, it's listening. It's it's that listening muscle, exercising that muscle uh, with curiosity. You know, we we've touched on some of these things already. You know, the five whys, right? That's about asking questions, but how do you know what question to ask if you're not listening? Like you really have to listen. You can't be formulating, you know, these ideas of your own, but to just really be present and really, you know, you hear it all the time, this active listening, right? But um, that is the one thing that you really need because you'll never understand people if you don't listen to them. Sure, sure. All right, Ray, it's story time. I need a story from Ray on when something went wrong under your watch, what you did to fix it, and then what lessons you learned from it to apply to your future career. Okay, so I, I think I think one it's a couple of things that just stand out to me over my career, and and one of them was, you know, you hear this saying, "See something, say something," and I didn't do that. So um, there was a there was a time when. Uh, it was just myself and one other person we were working working in these valve pits and uh, coming out of the pit when I was climbing the ladder it was one of those ladders that's installed in the facility so it's it's it has those metal rungs and it was my foot was wet I had on work boots but my foot still slipped a little bit on that ladder and uh, you know i didn't think anything about it just climbed out went back to work and uh, we had another pit on the other side went to do it and uh, i never mentioned to the guy hey you know watch your step um so when when i come out the second time no slip you know once again i'm in the comfort zone just keep going but i see i see my coworker coming out and i saw his hands on the ladder like he's almost out. And then all of a sudden his hands disappeared. And I heard this loud yell and scream. And this guy fell, you know, maybe like 12 feet back down into that pit. And fortunately, if you can say that, fortunately, his one of his legs actually got caught in the ladder, which kept oh, wow. him from truly hitting the bottom. Like he, he actually got caught in the ladder and he didn't hit his head on the bottom of the pit but it tore his knee up um he had to have like two or three surgeries on his knee um probably you know you know how that is probably never truly walked the same again and it, it was just a scary thing on the scene like firefighters they had to you know kind of airlift him out of there and uh and i was like you know all i had to do was say Hey man, I almost slipped. And so from there, it just changed my whole perspective on safety and how important it is to, to share any kind of near miss, any of those things that exist. And so that especially at that time, I was actually a senior mechanic, but you know, as a senior, you still kind of run the crew. But when I came into my supervision, when I, all of those years that I was in, in supervision, I made that a priority, right? That we were going to be safe. We were going to do things safe. We were not going to cut any corners. And fortunately, I didn't have to worry about an incident like that the rest of my career. Wow. Wow. Thanks for that story. You see something, say something. I'm sure everybody can get something out of that for sure. Yeah. Something All right. So, is that? <laughs> yeah. 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 What um what would you say is something that Ray does proactively and intentionally to keep showing up year after year, day after day, better and better? Um, it's it's just that that hunger that you have to have um, for a purpose in your life. You know, like what is your purpose, and and that purpose is what gets you up every morning. That purpose is what helps you to overcome the difficulties, overcome the 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 things that are challenging for you, you know, when it gets tough, when it gets hard, you have this reason, you know. So for for me, as I said, part of my background was was my faith. And and for me, 
you know, I feel like I was called. I had this purpose in life of liberating people. Like I was, I was uh, not only spiritually, but physically, <laughs> you know, in enslaved, so to speak. And, and I don't want anybody to go through that. And, and so any way that I can show up, and make a difference in somebody's life and say something, show them something that can set them free on whatever level it is. That's what I wake up to do. And so I tell myself every morning, like when I wake up, I tell myself, you know, I'm going to, you know, liberate with love. And that's how I feel like love is like this, this centering thing for me that love can overcome anything. And if I can give people, everybody in the world wants some love, if I'm just going to smile at you, <laughs> you know, and give you a smile that you didn't get today, I'm going to do that to try to lift somebody up and pull them out of whatever state they may be in. And, and you, you, you know, it, I, I never find a day where I don't find some way to lift somebody up. You know, so finding that purpose, that may not be yours, but whatever yours is, it just keeps you going. Sure, sure. I like that. What would you say is the biggest misconception about your position? Like, let's say I ask somebody, you know, ask your wife, hey, what does Ray do all day, every day for, for the community, for the city of Houston? What would she get totally wrong in answering that question? <laughs> I, I, think the, I think the part that people get wrong is... Uh, they feel like this is just this feel good thing. <laughs> you know, uh, when you talk about culture or, you know, a lot of times you can throw in engagement, you know, they, they think it's just about um, these feel good things uh, that, you know, having this event where we're gonna get all excited and this, that, and the other, or we're gonna have some food, uh, this, that, and the other. They think it's all of that kind of thing, or they see me on these meetings and I may give some inspirational speech or some motivational speech or something of that nature. And they think it's just all kind of glam. Like I, I ran into one guy, he was like, hey man, I know you, you're the guy on the TV. Like, you know? <laughs> and for them, it's this internal TV, but you know, it's kind of almost like this celebrity status. They just think it's all fluff and it's all lights and cameras and things of that nature. Uh, but the reality is it's really about making a difference in the community. It's about making sure that these uh, people, our team members are in a space where they can provide the best service. And at the end of the day, it wouldn't make it wouldn't make a difference if everybody was happy, but the services were not good and improving, right? And so I think that's the misconception is people people tend to miss that my work is really about improving services out there. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, if you were commissioned to put up a billboard and this billboard is in the most trafficked area of Houston, what ask of your community, let's say in regards to culture, um, or in regards to water, however you want to spin it, what ask of your community would you want to put on this billboard? I think what I would want to put on there is to appreciate <laughs> your public servants, your civil per public servants. You know, uh, when, when people, if we're fortunate enough to wake up in the morning, you, you wake up in a home that was permitted, and that was inspected by public works employees to ensure that that home is safe for you. And you get up and you take a shower and you turn on that water that Houston water is producing and you know you use your morning restroom uh, and, and you flush and it goes somewhere and you, and you get to brush your teeth, you get to wash your face. And, and all of those things come from Houston Public Works. And, and you get in your car and you pull out onto a street that's paved and it has lines and markers on it. And you pull up to a stop sign and lights, things that keep you from just running into each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as you go throughout your day, all of these things that you are taking for granted it's, it's these public works people who make your life pleasurable and easy, right? 
and 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 I'm not taking anything away from our police officers, from our firefighters. I'm not taking anything. They do an important job, but you can't put those fires out without water, right? And you can't get to those fires without streets. Right? You can't answer those calls. You can't you can't uh, make it through those lights without them being programmed by somebody to say this is an emergency and these lights need to be green right now. Right, like all of these things. When we have storms here in 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 uh, Houston, we have floods. We have all of these natural natural disasters. You know, we're the guys who come out and have those big high water vehicles that get the police and the firefighters where they need to be. That clear all those trees out the street. It's so many things that I haven't touched on that we do, and these things are taken for granted. And I would just want. Um, this billboard in some way to say acknowledge our public works employees in a real and meaningful way love it love it let's uh, i always like to leave a space on the show for you to thank mentors that you had along your journey and then also offer up a word of inspiration and motivation to your industry counterparts yeah well um in public works, some of you may have heard of uh, a gentleman named Mr. Eric Darden. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was in an APWA conference here recently. He was named one of the top 10 leaders in public works across the across the country. And I was very fortunate. He was the person who invited me to, to serve in this role that I'm serving in. And uh, he's just an awesome leader. And the thing that stood out to me most is that he could find that balance. You know how we just talked about sometimes people have these misconceptions about what I do, but he could find that balance as a leader between the production side of things and the people side of things. Like he, he understood that people make these things happen. And, and so he knew how to take care of people, but then he also knew how to, to measure and make sure everything was, was being done at a high standard and that there was always some kind of continuous improvement going on to innovate how we serve the community. And, and he would do this in an unflappable way, right? Like he would, he would never let all of these things make him sweat. And, uh, and the thing that I took from him as he was moving to San Diego and and, I, and San Diego, you're very lucky. <laughs> uh, was was he told me just always be prepared, Ray? Right, just be prepared for life. Be prepared for anything that you're going to be a part of. If, if you're prepared, it doesn't surprise you, and you won't always know it all. But you you will have a leg up, you'll, you'll be in a position where you can still make a difference if you're prepared. And, and I think that translates to anything in our life, right? How prepared are we? When you think about what's ahead, when you think about some of the challenges that are in the world, how are you preparing yourself to meet those challenges? Are you stepping up as, as a leader in this organization to say, I wanna be one of those leaders who will be ready for the challenges of tomorrow. I will create a space to allow my people to be innovative and to share new ideas, to try new things that they've never done before so that we can prepare ourselves for when it happens. You know, you know how COVID came along and it forced us to embrace technologies that existed before. And we have to ask ourselves, do we wanna be forced that way or as leaders do we want to start preparing that way for these technological advances to come forth even in some of the quote-unquote mundane things that we do in public works sure, sure all right right let's say i'm coming to town i'm going to houston i text you ahead of time i'm like hey ray where can i go to get the best burger in houston where are you going to send me I'm going to send you to one or two places. You have to give me this. So uh, two places, <laughs> two, two places. It depends on what you like. Right. So it's this one place called the burger joint. 
So you know if the place has burger in its name, it's probably focusing on some good burgers, right? So if you want this like crafted, 100% Angus burger, you know, some things that are different, you know, like some varieties, they try in different sauces and different combinations. You want something like that really, really good, the burger joint. But then if you're a person that just want a old school, like homemade burger, you know, like, like no fluff, yeah. no, no extras, no, this is just, this is the way it comes but it's just homemade, just full of love. It's called cream burger. And the thing, the thing about cream burger is you also get some uh, milkshakes that's out of this world, <laughs> you know, but it's like that little mom and pop place. It's right across yeah. the street from, uh, from U of H. You, you're close to U of H, go to cream burger <laughs> and you got to have cash. They don't take cards. <laughs> I like it even more now. I like it more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, so if you like that, like grandmama's hamburger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Ray. Thank you for hopping on the podcast, man. To all the listeners out there, thank you for listening in. Ray, any final words before we get out of here? Uh, no, I just want to encourage everybody, just like I said, we, we may be taken for granted here in, in, in uh, Houston Public Works or Public Works all across this country, but never lose sight of the difference that you're making every day. On the other end of what you do every day, there's a mother, there's a grandmother, there's a father, a grandfather, there's people on the other side of what you're doing that even when they don't realize that you're the one who's doing it, just see yourself as the Wizard of Oz, right? You're the person behind the curtain making all the magic happen for our citizens. Take pride in that, be proud of it, and keep serving with your heart, with your mind, and making these things happen, whether you get the credit or not. You can be proud of knowing what you're doing and how important that is to our cities and our country. And so, Thank you for your service and all that you're doing. All right, Ray. Thank you for that. All the listeners out there, make sure you share this with somebody who you think needs to hear it. And this has been a Public Works podcast. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in.